see that, we can start going. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, as Sam said, my name's uh, Dan Peterson, and I'm going to be talking to you today um, probably fairly quickly. You don't have a, a lot of time, and there's quite a bit to get through um, about the work that I've been doing um, around the literary resurrection of R. Murray Gilchrist, um, with the sub subtitle of How I'd Done a Book. So I'm going to be going through a timeline of Gilchrist um, and his work, and then a bit about the process of uh, how I got to a place where I could um, bring his stories back as part of the Tales of the Weird series for the British Library. Um, my details are there and I can put them in the chat later on. If uh, you don't follow me on Twitter, please do. Um, always good to chat to folk. Um, and we have a picture of Mr Gilchrist there. One I always like to look uh, to use in talks like this because whenever I feel nervous about doing a talk, I always sort of think that I never look as nervous as Gilchrist does in most of the pictures that we have of him. He always looks um, certainly haunted, um, which is very appropriate. So who was Robert Murray Gilchrist? Uh, well, Gilchrist was born in 1867 in the city of Sheffield in the north of England. Um, and at the time then, um, and fairly, really as a time now, Sheffield was a fairly industrial uh, city, part of the sort of industrial heartland of Victorian England. The photo there is from slightly later, that's from the 1880s, but you can see really a mix of what would be becoming a modern city with um, streets and lighting, but in the distance, the sort of smokestacks of um, uh, factories and foundries. And Gilchrist started off uh, working as a cutler, making cutlery in one of the Sheffield steel mills. He quickly found that that wasn't for, uh, for him, um, and he then moved on uh, to being an author um, full time. He was a prodigious author. He wrote 22 novels and he wrote six collections of short stories. Most of them are of the sort of Gothic romantic um, bent. Um, but my main interest is in the stories that are in the collection called The Stone Dragon and Other Tragical Romances. That was released in 1894 uh, by a publisher called Methuen. Um, and they described it as a volume of stories of power so weird and original as to ensure them a ready welcome. And we'll come on to that later on, the use of weird stories, very early use of um, effectively what will become weird fiction. Um, it was well received. Um, the, he was um, uh, compared to writers like Poe and to Baudelaire. Um, but a number of the more kind of establishment um, critics found him very lurid and um, I think there was one a reviewer called him darkly sensuous which now seems like quite a good thing and something that we might be um, into but it was too much for the people of the time. And in 1917 when Gilchrist died very suddenly um, from pneumonia uh, at the age of 50 he was already sort of becoming a much more obscure writer and falling out of um, the public eye. There were attempts by friends to kind of give him a bit of a revival, um, but he just didn't seem to mesh with um, public. He was either too much of one thing or too little of another, um, and he didn't really find the, um, the acceptance that he wanted. And one of um, his friends described him as not bitter, um, but very disappointed that his writing hadn't um, made the mark that he had uh, hoped it would do. And then we have quite a leap, really, of time from 1917 to 1998. Um, and the Caron Press reprinted The Stone Dragon in its entirety, effectively a, a like for like um, republishing. There have been some attempts in the 70s to bring some of his writing back. A couple of his stories appear in some uh, anthologies, um, but again, never really uh, got that traction. And neither did um, the Stone Dragon reprints. Um, Caron are quite a, a small, were a small publishers. I think they've um, gone the way of all things now. But um, only a few uh, copies were made, very expensive, um, as these small um, press editions normally are. There was a bigger release in 2003, Ashtree Press, again, another small um, print um, house uh, based in the US. They released uh, a collection called The Basilisk and Other Tales of Dread. That takes all of the stories uh, from The Stone Dragon, but notably they added in um, some of uh, Gilchrist's other stories from other publications, probably most notably The Crimson Weaver, which was uh, a work that he had published in The Yellow Book, um, a notorious publication of its time. 
There's also a good introduction, which brings in some uh, biographical elements and kind of explanations of some of the stories, which is the first time um, that that was done in any of Gilchrist's collections. And then in 2006, uh, we have A Night on the Moor, which was released as part of uh, the Wordsworth Editions, a series, um, and that goes back really, it kind of takes a blend of the Stone Dragon and the Basilisk. It adds in the extra stories that Ashley Press added in. It doesn't have any of the um, uh, introductions or biographical details. And tellingly, when the Wordsworth Editions uh, collection was rebooted um, a few, probably about five years ago or so, um, Gilchrist wasn't on the roster anymore. Uh, they dropped him. So it seems even now, um, or at least in the early 2000s, um, he didn't quite catch the market that he was hoping for. However, this is where I come in. Um, in probably around 2010, um, my memory is, is hazy about last week, let alone that far back, um, I picked up a copy of A Night on the Moor in a second-hand bookshop, um, mainly because I'd got some of the other uh, words with editions of their Tales of Mystery and Supernatural um, series. It sounded interesting, and I picked it up and promptly put it on a shelf, and um, characteristically didn't read it for quite some time. But around 2017, I had read it. I think I've read it a few years um, previously, and I've been thinking about his stories. They were very striking, um, particularly The Crimson Weaver, uh, which is the first story in The Night on the Moor, and I've used it as the first story in um, I Am Stone as well. And how he, in very small amounts of um, words and time, uses very dense symbology um, to create his stories. And one of the things that struck me, particularly around the Crimson Weaver, but other stories as well, is how he uses uh, plants and flower symbology to add layers of meaning and kind of context for people who want to um, discover them and add extra bits to the stories that we've got. So I wrote an article uh, called Bastard with Fainting Flowers, which takes a line from Crimson Weaver, and that was published in Dead Reckonings, um, which is the in-house journal of the Hippocampus Press, um, again, a US-based press, and they deal with uh, largely republishing the letters of authors like Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, um, those kind of uh, weird authors. So that kicked off a kind of more academic interest in what Gilchrist uh, was doing and what he was trying to accomplish with his writing. Um, and that got um, me kind of thinking I could do more with this and I could work more and try to find out more about um, Gilchrist and just effectively fell down the rabbit hole of trying to find out more about his life and his writing. After Dead Reckoning's article, um, I um, presented a paper at the Tales of Terror conference in, at the University of Warwick. Um, organised by Jen Baker, who also has um, a very good uh, collection in the Tales of the Weird series. And that was called I No Longer Live in This House. Uh, again, another line from the Gilchrist story, this time one called The Return, which is a sort of ghost story, sort of vampire story. And in that I talked about um, concepts of undeath um, and equally sort of unliving. Um, I'll come on to this a bit later on, but Gilchrist is very interested in um, the kind of liminality between life and death, neither one nor the other, but not really archetypal um, undead characters and figures. He kind of takes them and twists them and weirds them up, again, coming back into this kind of use of, of weird fiction. And this really is the crux point of um, the work that I was doing, which led, uh, arguably, directly led to the, um, the publication of the book, because one of the other speakers at um, Tales of Terror was a guy called Johnny Davidson. And Johnny is the series editor of the British Tale Library's Tales of the Weird collection. And um, as soon as I realized he was there and he wasn't meant to be there, he was filling in for somebody else. Um, I am not normally the kind of person who would walk up and just speak to somebody and introduce myself. Um, I found that quite difficult, but it seemed like an opportunity I couldn't miss. So um, he had a little stall with some of the books and the pretense of buying books. Um, which is actually probably one of the more comfortable ways of doing it. I had a chat with him um, and asked if he'd um, watch my talk, which he had, um, and whether he thought that Gilchrist uh, would be uh, a good subject for the Tales of the Weird series. And he effectively said, well, that's up to you. You have to make me think that it is, and it's, worth, it's, I, it's an interesting book, and it's a book that we can sell. So he can challenge me to say, um, uh, outline why it is that Gilchrist's writing is important, 
why is he um, and his writing more important than maybe the other pitches that they're getting that they can fit into their release schedule? And more importantly, why I should be doing it. Is there anybody else who would be better at it? So those two kind of main um, elements became my work um, in this area for the next wee while. We'll see that it's quite a lengthy um, process. In 2020, um, I did a talk, which some of you may have seen, called I Am Stone for Romancing the Gothic. Um, and in that, I kind of got to the point of thinking, why is it that Gilchrist is interesting? And why is it that he is someone who should um, effectively come back from the dead? And to do that, I kind of thought about what it is that makes me interested in his writing. And it's very much this meeting point of decadent Gothic and weird fiction. Gilchrist was born in the same year that um, Baudelaire died. So you've got that fade in the way of decadent writing. At the high point of when Gilchrist was writing, not necessarily writing his weird, theory, um, his weird stories, but writing his um, romantic fiction, Dracula was released. And then the year that um, uh, Gilchrist died, H.P. Lovecraft was writing The Tomb, which, although it was published many years later on, is probably one of the, his first um, truly weird pieces of fiction. So you've got this arc, and Gilchrist lurks um, in, in the, the middle of it. So I thought that that's interesting. I could write something about how even though Gilchrist is sort of not really weird, he's weird, lowercase w, weird, maybe, but he's much more um, embedded in decadence and gothic fiction, how that allows us to look at where weird fiction comes from. Um, sometimes it's kind of made out that weird fiction just erupted, um, possibly erupted, slightly different use of the word, and it just happened. And it's always Lovecraft, it's always people around like that. But it isn't. He was inspired by lots of early writers, Gilchrist possibly being one of them. And also, one thing that's very interesting, especially for the time that Gilchrist was writing, is that a lot of his stories have a kind of proto-feminist, proto-queer theme going through them. Gilchrist himself was gay, um, and he lived with his partner um, in his home in Derbyshire for um, around 20 years or so. And or equally, um, a lot of his, not necessarily the protagonists, but the main characters or the more active characters are women. The men, as we'll see later on, are often very um, apathetic and pathetic in both different ways. So he kind of pushes, I think maybe, um, not necessarily unknowingly, I think he's definitely got an intent there. It's not super foregrounded, but it definitely is there. And that makes him interesting because obviously, a lot of the people, um, <clears throat> Lovecraft, in weird fiction are pretty horrible and don't have that kind of um, understanding. So I think just those few points make Gilchrist interesting and worth revisiting. The bigger question, the more difficult question, is why it should be me. Um, I have never edited um, <laughs> a big collection of uh, stories for the British Library. Um, I've been writing um, for a long time. Um, I was a music journalist for a while, so I can, I can write, and I've um, had articles published. But ultimately, nobody else was doing it. So I don't think really anybody um, was talking about Gilchrist. There's some articles from a few people that you can find, um, but he's not a big figure. So that novelty um, is quite um, a good selling point. I can do it. Um, there isn't anybody else who's looking at it. But equally, I've got a proposition in mind of looking at Gilchrist stories more deeply, um, as I mentioned before, only really the Ashtree Press uh, art, uh, publication had any kind of introduction or context. I pitched that I could, um, based on the work that I've done, the talk for uh, Romancing the Gothic, the other articles and papers that I've done, I could pull together fairly quickly a good introduction about Gilchrist and about his stories. Also, I could get, delve into the stories themselves and build up a glossary for some of the stories. One of um, Gilchrist's possible failings, it's one thing I love him for, but I think it's one thing that trips up a lot of people, is that he's obsessed with archaic terms and references. He effectively lives in the 17th century. He kind of um, drops in references to people and things and events that I don't think even people in the late 1800s um, would have understood, let alone uh, nowadays. Very niche references. But again, like his flower symbology, they, they all are there for a purpose. They all add layers of meaning to his work. 
And also, because I'd been looking at Gilchrist for um, a long time, I'd managed to find, um, some earlier and some later, three other stories that had never been republished since Gilchrist's death. The Sir Toby's wife, which is illustrated there, is kind of a gothic, um, much more of a gothic story. I think to, to say it involves entombment um, and various other uh, very gothic elements is uh, not so much of a spoiler, but that is, um, shows how involved he is in the, um, in the gothic side of writing. There's a story called The Holocaust, which suddenly appeared in an archive, um, actually a US archive, um, that is very interesting because it's the word Holocaust obviously to us is, is a very jarring and unpleasant, deeply unpleasant thing to think about. But Gilchrist is using it um, in the original sense of an offering, a burnt offering. And he looks, it's kind of quite a, has a very religious sacrificial um, elements in it. Um, it's very dense. It's um, a reported story. So it's a serving maid who's telling us the story of something that happened long ago. It gets very weird and convoluted, um, but that makes the ending um, when it finally comes all the more uh, shocking, I think. And then there's one called A Strolling Player, and that is uh, a selection of uh, what Gilchrist kind of called his peak stories. So the Derbyshire Peak District, um, they are effectively tales of local people. Um, and um, using folklore and uh, kind of bucolic is not really the, the right word because it's really um, sort of pleasant, but it's uh, of the land that he is involved. And that largely um, depicts um, a funeral procession going across the snowy peak district. Um, but strangely, it's a very dark story, a very grief ridden story. But, and again, hopefully not too much of a spoiler, it has a very rare for Gilchrist happy ending. So to have those in, that then um, gives us more insight into Gilchrist's work. So for the British Library, who obviously want to sell books um, and make money off them, um, that kind of uh, was a selling point. There are some stories that people are interested in Gilchrist would probably never have seen before. So two years after I first spoke to Johnny, um, and quite a long time after I thought about maybe I can um, get a book going out of this and bring Gilchrist back, um, I finally got an email saying that they want to go ahead with it. Um, I was out walking the dog at the time and it pinged up on my phone and I almost dropped the phone and the dog almost got frightened. Um, because like oh, is often the case, the, um, uh, the kind of little header that came up was, I am sorry, dot, dot, dot. So that was kind of a, a roller coaster of emotions. But I'd been pestering Johnny effectively kind of every other month or something, sending him an email saying, how's things going? Are we still on for this? And I had almost thought, well, it's just not going to happen. He's just being too polite. But um, no, um, it was going to happen, which is quite remarkable. So um, that was March. And I, in the next three months then, to get the book ready for the August publication date, I had to write the introduction. Um, do all that grouping of the stories into thematic sections uh, with some contextual details for each of them, create this mad glossary that I decided to work on, and then read the damn thing again and again, um, because there were lots of different elements coming and changing. We did layout changes and things like that. So I've read this book a lot um, uh, going through, and that's probably one of the more demanding and um, certainly draining parts of, of the whole process, strangely enough. Thankfully, I didn't have to actually write the actual stories. Gilchrist had kindly already done that for me, uh, which was very nice of him. And one of the best things about working um, for the British Library, there's lots of good things, they were really, really um, friendly and helpful, is that they already had all of the stuff that I wanted to do deep in their archives. Um, obviously, as the British Library, they have pretty much all the stories. Um, so they could get them out and digitally um, render them into the book. So that made things a lot easier for me, which was good. But I still had a lot of work to do. So the introduction, we don't really have very much uh, biographical detail for Gilchrist. Um, there's no biography, no kind of official biography. There is some uh, details. The Sheffield archives have some of his diaries, but obviously we were sort of deep in pandemic and traveling was difficult. And I don't think they're even open. So referring to them was going to be difficult. However, we do have a book called The Apple Trees, which is by Hugh Walpole, who is a descendant of the Walpole. Um, so he was a friend of Gilchrist's um, and he does this very, it's a very brief uh, kind of memoir fragment, um, but he really is evocative 
of who Gilchrist was and how he was. And he starts his memoirs by saying that Gilchrist liked candles and Elizabethan thickness of atmosphere, and if possible, the rain beating on the leaded panes. And I use that quote to start the introduction um, because I think it gives us this idea of someone who is very possibly slightly out of time. He lives in a manor house on the uh, Derbyshire Moors, uh, low, dark ceilings. Um, he, lived, he and his partner George live in one wing of the house. His mother and his sister live in the other. And apparently um, they would creep from one to the next, and it's only by candles. So we get an idea of this, this character. A tall man, well built. Um, his main love after writing was uh, tramping across the moors, uh, dressed in tweeds and with a heavy stick. Um, so we can see someone who kind of loomed in the darkness. And Walpole's very, um, very emotional, really, writing about his friendship with Gilchrist. He seems to have had a lot of care and a lot of love for the man, um, he describes as, as gentle and kind. We also have reviews, contemporary reviews of his books. Um, they kind of range from um, over effusive uh, to scathing, depending on um, the largely the conservative nature of the publication that we're writing for, but we can get good feeling of how people thought about Gilchrist. And then effectively my theories that I've built up from those articles and those talks and those lectures, I could cram some of that in to make, hopefully um, draw a reader in. But I only had one and a half thousand words, which is not a lot to try and um, describe a person's life and their work. Um, I actually went over the word count, but nobody seemed to notice, so that was okay. The categorization I wanted to do, because previous editions had effectively um, just listed the books, uh, listed the stories, and there was no real um, sense of trying to order them. Um, I wanted to do that to try and bring out, again, subtly bring out these themes that Gilchrist constantly goes back to. So um, that was, I think, the most difficult part of the editing process. A lot of stories got moved around because the categorization kind of blurs. Um, some of them, you know, don't feature maybe undead characters so much, but it's a pivotal point. So does that fit into one category or the next? The four categories that I um, chose are all effectively quotes from stories that he, um, uh, he wrote. So the first one we have is Dead Yet Living. And again, this talks about Gilchrist's kind of obsession with the not dead and the not living, rather than what we might think of as undead creatures. We have sort of vampires, but not really Dracula vampires, not really Nosferatu vampires. We have ghosts, but are they ghosts or are they um, living people who have fallen out of time in some way? And then we have a very disturbing story, Dame Inno's Lad, which takes a few reads to actually get the gist of what's going on. But that involves, at the end, a revenant, but a specific quite chilling kind of revenant. And we have, and I know Sam likes this one, Useless Heroes, which is a quote from the manuscript of Francis Shackley. And this talks about how um, Gilchrist narrators um, are often um, men, and they are the, the kind of uh, man who has some kind of mis uh, largely unexplained wealth. Um, they don't really have jobs, they kind of uh, go around. They're often torn between um, lovers and torn between aims in their lives. But as I've mentioned, they're kind of useless. Um, they don't do a lot apart from um, narrating the story. Often they're narrated from the future, kind of looking back mournfully sense. And it's um, the women and sometimes young girls in the stories who are far more active and far, uh, take control of their own stories, even um, if largely they come to a sticky end. And then the third, uh, the sort of third of the, the ones is the last category of his, what is really his weird and gothic stories of passion and death. And this, I think, is um, uh, Gilchrist's main um, uh, theme that goes through a lot of his writing. And we're talking here about passion in its kind of original sense, like the passion of Christ, of suffering, and of suffering um, sometimes on behalf of somebody else, but suffering because of your, your desires um, and your failings a lot of the time. So we have there, um, again, in the Holocaust, where a mother sacrifices herself. We have My Friend, which I think is one of Gilchrist's most interesting stories, two male companions who are traveling along, um, very uh, queer undertones to the story, but a very mournful story of someone who can't quite fully express their, uh, their life and live their fullest life, but with a little twist at the end um, of optimism 
that maybe in the future, in some other time, um, they may be able to express themselves more fully. And then the final um, three stories, the panicle, a witch in the peak and the strolling player are this peak weird. Um, the panicle and a witch in the peak are written in almost incomprehensible dialect uh, of the time, Derbyshire dialect. Um, they are, I think, really evocative, brilliant stories. The panicle is um, hilarious when you actually figure out what's going on. Um, but to read them out loud, um, if you can, uh, makes a lot more sense of them. And then at the end, I had to do uh, this glossary, which I promised Johnny, and then suddenly realised that this is going to be a big piece of work. But it is a labour of love. Um, I love basically words and figuring out where they come from, what their, what their derivation is and their etymology. Um, so I just went through reading through the stories and tried to look for all of the strange and archaic words um, that Gilchrist uses. Culvers are mentioned repeatedly, and that's just a pigeon. But it's culver has this kind of strange, tonguey sense and makes it a much better way of talking about things. Plaisance, as well, is a word that he uses repeatedly. And that's effectively a garden um, that's used solely for pleasure. So um, a kind of um, arranged flower garden or things like that. The glossary ended up twice as long as the introduction. So it's about three and a half thousand words um, just explaining the words that Gilchrist uses. But what I needed to do, I kind of found myself getting a bit carried away. And rather than explaining every single word, using um, uh, this kind of glossary to add context and enhance the understanding um, of readers um, who may not have um, yet kind of come into contact with some of these strange words. And I think there on that text, that's the uh, start of the glossary for the Crimson Weaver, so the first story in the collection. And you have the columnberry, and a columnberry is a dovecote. So it's a um, small house the birds live in. And in the story, the Crimson Weaver herself keeps birds. She keeps um, doves that fly around her, her world. But columnberry is the same etymological derivation as columbarium. And that is a very similar structure, normally a stone structure, with niches for funerary urns. So um, effectively the souls of the dead um, their ashes and their last remains are stored in a similar house to the columbary of birds. And that very heavily implies, which isn't really mentioned in the story, at least not explicitly, that the birds that the Crimson Weaver uh, keeps are actually the persisting souls of her victims. And that kind of the way that Gilchrist talks about the, the birds as they flutter around and squawk and shriek, um, gives you a kind of strange, much more strange tinge to the story, which is already quite a strange story. So after doing all that work um, in August, uh, towards the end of August, um, I put 20, it's 2010, 2021, not 11 years ago, um, that's 10 years roughly since I first read uh, Gilchrist's story, we actually get uh, Iron Stone in the shops, uh, which is staggering to me. Um, it's every time I, I think about it, especially when I see it in, um, in Blackwell's on their uh, three for two offer. It's just the best thing ever. Um, it's the 25th entry in the Tales of the Weird series, and you can see there some of the other ones. All of them, I think, excellent. Um, some of them are like mine, single author collections. Some of them are anthologies of uh, thematic tales. And I don't think it's a brag to say that it's the most comprehensive collection of Gilchrist's weird and gothic fiction yet published. Um, it certainly has uh, more um, stories in than any of the few others that have been released. And um, I think things like the introduction and the, um, uh, the glossary hopefully make it a, a more interesting read for modern readers. So I've added in just sort of finally, this last few minutes, um, some do's and don'ts of what I've learned from how I've done a book. Look and privilege are uh, basically everything. Johnny, the editor, wouldn't, shouldn't have been at the, um, at the conference. Uh, he was brought in by Jen at the last minute because somebody dropped out um, and he just did a talk about the, the Tales of the Weird series. So luck very much comes in there, but I'm massively privileged in being able to go to these conferences, certainly back in the old times when they were um, in person. Um, I could afford to get to Warwick um, and I could, um, I had the time to be able to, um, to effectively write, um, write the talk. But equally, I'm not an academic, really. Um, I'm not in the sense of being affiliated um, with any um, uh, university. 
So a lot of the time getting hold of texts um, and archives can be difficult. So everybody I think, has, their, um, has things that work for them and work against them. But the main thing is to be aware of that and do all you can to put yourself in a place to make best use of them. As long as you're not um, overriding anybody else, you would be better placed to do it. Um, and as long as you're not you know, harassing uh, people to uh, get them to help you or whatever. I think if you um, work in the background and maybe over a long period of time, um, you can get yourself into a place where look might work for you. Synergize is a terrible corporate word, but I'm a terrible corporate person in the day. So um, basically, if you can try and work things together, so all of the, um, the articles and the lectures that I have written and given in the past, I could draw on them. Don't redo anything. Just take what you've already worked on. Um, and again, use that time that you've already, um, already used up um, to try and give yourself a bit of a, a head start. And also don't go it alone. Writing is a very solitary um, activity a lot of the time. Um, and equally, there's sometimes a tendency to make yourself solitary because you kind of want to hide it until it's been fully released. And there's a worry that um, somebody else might be working on the same thing, which would have been pretty terrible. But um, things like writing the Gothic and Sam's support, uh, Jen from the Tales of Terror conference, um, huge amounts of people, not least of all my wife, who's in the other room, um, no doubt watching this at the moment, hopefully, um, hugely supportive. And just maybe a year might go by and nothing will happen with the work that you're doing. But if you reach out and speak to people, you might get one little, oh, that sounds good. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that. And for me, that kind of kept me going for another month, another two months. The fact that somebody said, it doesn't sound like a terrible idea, um, really, really helped. So always try and make yourself available um, to that kind of support. And ultimately persist. Um, it, like I say, it took two years from first speaking to Johnny to actually even get the idea that yes, we were gonna go ahead with this book. It took much longer um, for me to get to a position where I could have done it. Um, so it does feel kind of Sisyphean, like the picture there. Um, but if you do persist, hopefully, eventually, um, it will come to fruition. The do's always come followed with don'ts. So one of the main, there's two main points um, I've raised here. Don't move house in the middle of editing a massive, um, to you, very important book. That is a picture there of where I'm sitting now uh, when we moved into this two ha uh, new house a couple of months ago, um, right in the middle of the final editing of the book. And equally, um, don't have massive carpal tunnel surgery on your hand while you're trying to write a book. Um, I've had problems, uh, it's a, a positive thing to have done, um, but I had a lot of problems with um, movement and sensation in my right hand, my main, um, main hand, um, and I had the chance to have it operated on. But that meant I couldn't use my right hand at all for the final month of the um, editing process. So um, part of the book was jabbed out with one finger on my left hand, which was an interesting um, experiment, but not something I would want to do if I ever get to do another book. Which takes us to the what's next in the future. Um, I'm going to hopefully do some more talks like this. Um, I've been asked to um, do a couple of interviews. Frank has asked very kindly. We'll um, have a chat about things later on. Um, and also Laura and Mary from Google Guides um, are going to do a talk, uh, a chat uh, with some of the work that I've been doing. And again, um, Henry Bartholomew, who's done one of the Tales of the Weird series, he'll be right there, so hopefully we'll have a good chat about weird fiction. And what I want to do now that things are sort of opening up um, is actually get into more the non-fiction um, correspondence side of things. Um, I've got uh, letters to Gilchrist from writers like William Sharp um, and other friends, but to get into, have a look at Gilchrist diaries themselves uh, would be a good thing. So hopefully if I can get down to Sheffield, I'll be able to have a poke around what they've got for a couple of days. And if that can come to something, um, that would be good. It may take another 10 years to get done. We'll have to see. But that's uh, the end. So we've got a few minutes left. I, I finished these slides yesterday, so I wasn't entirely sure how long it would take. If anyone's got any questions, either about Gilchrist, uh, about the process of editing a book, um, if they've got ideas of a book they might want to do, I'm happy to fill them if you've got a few minutes.